warm welcome back to ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This is our 276th episode. And Eric, our producer, thanks, Eric, always has the number which accumulated viewer you are. So thanks for being with us again. Uh, and us is our triumvirate here of the three bald guys, our most, well, we can't say most remote because we're all over the place, but we have uh, our Banish Boston booster, Matt Loblet, back, and we have DeSoto Brown back in his Bishop Museum, and we have me, Martin Despang, back in Munich, Germany. And in this episode, which is the Boston Banish Boost Volume 13, we will commemorate the longevity of human life and its connections uh, between the three locations of us. Looking forward to. Hey guys. So um, DeSoto, we leave this appropriately up to you to talk about the long longevity of human life. In Honolulu, Hawaii, which we know statistically is the place that people get the oldest, live the longest, because we have the best conditions of climate and culture, uh, where climate is the closest to our natural vulnerable comfort. Absolutely. And that does have relevance to the discussion of buildings and architecture, as we will soon be discovering. But in this screen, we're looking at a glamour photo of my mother, which was taken in 1940 when she was 19 years old. Well, my mother just passed away last week at the age of 102, which is astonishing. She was born in 1920 and she managed to survive into 2023. So that's a pretty astonishing lifespan. And during that time, of course, she saw a great many things change, great many things happen. She lived through World War II here in the Hawaiian Islands, which was quite astonishing. She was on the island of Oahu on December 7th, 1941, to witness the Japanese attack, as was my father and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, except for one. So she saw a lot. Um, she lived through some interesting times. She lived for most of much of her life in an Ossipoff designed house. That's relevant for us as well. So we're commemorating my mother and uh, thank you for letting me do that, Martin. And now we can go back to our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> yeah, and if I do the math, so that must have been a, this picture, a beautiful picture must have been the year before. The attack, right? Because that was in yes. 40 and 41. That's that right. Happened. That's right. That and is exactly all right. Last time in 48, the house was built and but commissioned by other clients, but you moved in in 51? Correct. They moved in. I hadn't been born they yet. Moved. I was going to say, but then like a, a third of the next decade, you moved in because they, <laughs> you know, made you see the light of the world. That's right. So that's where I lived for, and I've, I've spent my entire life in and out of that house. Absolutely. And your mother is remembered for many things, obviously, by many people. And just as an example, the two show quotes at the bottom, one uh, is at the very bottom, just between us there, that's Anne Modonaga. And when we were visiting he her, and they're still living in our beloved um, Kahala Apartments, which the countdown is on when it falls back to Kamehameha School because it's leaves hold and we're holding our breath and hoping for the best of it. And uh, we were talking and she uh, talked about your mother and she said, oh, I, I know uh, Miss Brown as a fabulous shopper in Honolulu. So that's one of the many <laughs> things she's known for. And she appeared in our show with an image. Well, actually, she was actually uh, one of our most loyal viewers as well. But the audience hardly ever heard that. But when you were getting ready for the show in your house, uh, she was participating and sometimes after that. <laughs> but she only appeared other than here with this beautiful picture uh, in one show. That's the show quote in the middle right. And that was when we were reporting about the renovation of the part of our beloved um, Royal Hawaiian Center, shopping center, when she was shopping there with you, with her sister, who we see mm -hmm. there as well, right? Yeah, that's probably when, about when she was about 100 years old in exactly. her wheelchair. She was being wheeled around to look at things. She wasn't buying anything anymore, but she still liked to look at things. 
<laughs> yeah, she was running strong up till the very end. That's right, she okay. was. Let's try to cut the curve to, as you said, to our topic, but let's um, take one more image, your slide, next slide. To do that, and this is uh, about the skins or our longest in the production making shows of a dress code, a dress code, meaning building code and the relationship of the first human skin that we're born with. The second one that, as we just said, and this picture shows from your mom and her glamour time, the second skin is very important as well to human beings. And then we have the third one, which is our uh, thresholds and closures of buildings, facades. And um, Shopo's top right is what we started out with last time when Sammy and I were before we were coming back. And now we have quite a challenge to readapt to the cold, although uh, Matt and we have, although you know, far apart, we have similar weird, uh, seasonally untypical uh, warm climate conditions, but we still have to try to uh, get adept to that in a way. And um, some other young uh, man here in the back in the tempered, uh, which we see at the bottom right, dream of the tropics um, and dream of America because the two boxes there is a product Matt, we just talked before the show about America at its best and uh, and some parts not being there anymore but there's always signs of hope for me that was the company Nixon and the the choice of their their name is kind of odd because as far as human uh, representatives the name Nixon is not the most beloved <laughs> commemorated at least by some people but they named it after that. And they're a surf, uh, you know, uh, accessories uh, company and they, they make watches. And they're a great example of still holding up the good old American, you know, um, principle of innovation. And so these are two boxes that used to contain watches in there. But he has a picture there standing in, by the way, an Ikea shelf system there. And that is very familiar to you, DeSoto, that picture. Yeah, actually, that interestingly enough is is if a culturally very inappropriate photograph, which you would not guess right at the beginning to just look at it. That looks like a young hula dancer who is just sitting there on something. Well, she's sitting on a drum. She is sitting on a pahu. And that is actually a terrible thing to do. A pahu is considered to be something that almost has a soul. And the top of it, the drum head, is considered to be like the head of a person. So you do not sit ever <laughs> on a pahu. But this is someone who was just posed in a photo studio, and the photographer in the 1890s said, oh, sit on this with no top on, and you'll look really sexy. And so <laughs> it looks like, you know, it's this wonderful cultural picture, and it's actually a very erroneous cultural picture picture yeah. uh yeah. which most people don't know no thanks <laughs> for sharing and letting us know but also one has to say it is uh depicting actually the way um people and in that case women were dressed not long ago before that before contact right and when yes. white people told uh, the indigenous people, not just in Hawaii, uh, and not to dress like that anymore. And think about it between the beautiful picture of your mom and this one here is only three decades, 30 years, right? Yeah, that's, that is true. That is so, true. And then on the other side, not just of this slide, but the world and the other climates, um, we're having this brand new out article from scientists who went to where I'm from in the north of Germany and discovered uh, when humans were uh, taking on a second skin that is actually the first skin of animal life, which is a, a, a bear fur. And that's quite interesting. I was thinking and doing some, some uh, research on that you know, what did you do to stay warm in the freaking cold back in the days, right? And we all know somehow vaguely, we have these pictures of when we all had hair, I mean, not just on the head that we don't have anymore, but in general, right, all over the body. And at some point, we and our ancestors long, long ago discovered fire as to stay warm. 
And I was finding out that, you know, scientists are not quite clear. There's a span from 200,000 uh, years to 800,000 years. And there are some findings 500,000 years ago when that fire was invented. But it took until 6,000 years ago when uh, petroleum, which is petrified plants and animals, micro -animal organisms, um, were discovered. And then it took another, um, you know, it was 1,000 years ago only when uh, basically the, the internal combustion engine was first, you know, sketched out. But not until almost only 150 years ago, it was fully commercialized. So that's like a micro baby step in the whole span of history <laughs> that is now getting us all into trouble, right? This very short time, we had been so abusive with fossil fuel uh, than, than, than never before, right? So that's um, really interesting. And, and you, DeSoto, again, you're, it's almost like I feel uh, with all respect that thematically you seem to be more although officially you're you know a host but it seems to be like you're a guest because you might be the most remote from the building we're you know reporting about but you aren't because going back to your childhood uh you were in massachusetts and in boston and went to elementary school right and yes, i certainly only, did and, and i experienced only, i experienced that exactly and let's go to the next slide, which is getting us back to the building here for Harvard uh, that Matt, uh, you and your firm did. And uh, another connection is, I think that we were explicit um, uh, that we should, that your father has also something to do with Harvard, right? And in fact, with a department that Matt told me, reminded us, is right next to this one here, which is the engineering school, right? Right. And there, well, no, not the engineering school, but he went to the business school. So that's why I spent my first grade year in Boston, because my father was attending the Harvard Business School and the whole family went there to for him to do that. And so that was my first experience with bitter cold, lots of snow and the whole <laughs> Nine yards. I was not wearing a bear skin. I was at that point clad in not so much synthetics yet because there weren't as many synthetics. There weren't puffy jackets made of synthetics at that point. But I have experienced that. So I do know what it's like. I did it again uh, some years later when I was a teenager. So, yes, I know what that is like, even though I'm a pampered tropical person who is uh, too delicate to deal with cold at this point. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, sorry for the confusion, but that's what I meant to say. The Matt just told me that the business school is right next to the engineering school. So they're neighbors, right? And again, what you and your father had to do and what you always have to do, Matt, uh, in the winter when it's not unusually warm like now, when I have to do in Munich, this is what buildings have to do as well, or they should do just as well, right? They should mm -hmm. basically do that, and they should perform in a way that when the climate is, as we call, tempered, which is always a little confusing because increasingly in climate change, we think it's temperamented because it jumped from the very cold to the very hot and back uh, and almost like skips on the, the moderate parts in between. But buildings basically have to do, and just like we human beings, we then take off layers and we put on layers. And how then buildings should do that, could do that. We're in the midst of, again, reminding us, thanks to Matt. So here is the project again, the new engineering school for Harvard. And let's go back in and you explain us not just its layout, but also, again, its sort of cocooning and its, um, its uh, conditioning of uh, comfort level. Yeah, so, um, I mean, as you mentioned, it's the... This is the ground floor plan of uh, the engineering school. So it's it's all of the spaces that are directly at the street level. Um, and um, it's a very large building. Uh, it's about 500 feet long. And so you start to see in the way that the, the spaces, these chunks of, of rooms are kind of broken up, the, the desire to break the massing down and create multiple points of entry to this public zone that kind of connects all of these different spaces at the ground level. Um, and, and so this happens to be uh, sort of the most public floor of the building naturally because of its position next to the, next to the street and in the public realm. 
um, but also because uh, it services all of the undergraduate functions that the building provides. So um, the so sort of classrooms you can see on the left hand part of the, the of the slide here. There's um, a, a kind of a cluster of uh, classrooms, flat floor classrooms, and slope floor classrooms, and seminar rooms. Uh, and then along in the spaces that kind of line the street uh, to the top of the slide are uh, also they're all sort of let's say engineering focused kind of making spaces for um, student activity so that there's a lot of student activity that's placed very visibly on the street level and and, and facing towards the towards the the public part of the campus the whole building then kind of wraps around an outdoor courtyard which is in the bottom part of the slide um, and and is is landscaped in a, in a variety of different ways the center portion is a kind of a, a manicured more of a manicured lawn for uh, events and graduations and things like that and then ringing that main space is uh is a bioswale that treats and filters all of the stormwater that falls on the site and then collects it for reuse inside of the building mm -hmm. there's a term in architectural theory that especially the work of Stefan Banish and you guys have been sort of labeled with, and that is, and the work of the late work of Gunther too. I mean, probably as the from the beginning, that is organic, right? And mm. obviously, it's sort of postmodern terms that got misunderstood as just formal, right? That things are not rectangular and straight. But let, let's talk a little bit about about that. That um, uh, talking about the human body, it, it reminds me almost as if these sort of you know what's uh, basically here uh, rendered in in grayish brownish is basically seems to be like come across as organs functionally and then the circulation in between continue to stretch these sort of metaphors to the medical realm um which we found out that both you know Stefan Banish, the youngest son and mine are in that realm of the <laughs> medical realm as well on a personal mm -hmm. You know, traditionally, corridors can almost be like, you know, cardly clogged. <laughs> but here it seems like that what's rendered in yellow is basically infusing and aerating, you know, as you said already, flushing with light and fresh air and with, you know, um, with um, frequency and um you know, uh, people, right? Is that is that sort of fair to say or discuss? Yeah, no, definitely. I think, I mean, there's no reason why the, the two walls of any corridor space have to be parallel to one another. And I think particularly given the kind of the ebb and flow of traffic and the way that people move through the, through the building, uh, it kind of creates this opportunity for those spaces to be, um, it, to be variable and to create, use, use the kind of eddies of space that get created when two walls kind of, you know, radically diverge from from each other uh, is a place where people could naturally kind of occupy a certain area of floor. So you sort of you can see through the drawings of the furniture in these plans, kind of the areas where that space opens up to its greatest extent and allows um, people to sort of linger uh, and sit down and kind of and kind of really occupy some of these areas um, in, in, a, in a way that's different the way from the way that you would occupy the more programmatic um, usable spaces that are in the as you said in the gray areas. Yeah. Matt, I have a question, and I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but for the the the, the progression from the thought and then the drawing and then the the actual building when it's in use is a long one and there are many changes that are made in the construction of and when this building was completed are there things and I, again i don't want to put you on the spot but are there things that work better than others that you can point out that once people were actually in it and doing things you realized oh maybe it would have been better if we did it this way because people don't want to walk around there they want to walk to that that's a really great question, uh, DeSoto. And 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 I mean, you're absolutely right. I think any any building is really just a record of the state of the art five years before it opens, right? Because once we we draw these things, and then they have to basically go into this construction process, and the the design of the building freezes during that period. I mean, we make changes a little bit along the way, but the basics are there. But industry doesn't stop and innovation doesn't stop and our, our, our kind of normal patterns of life um, and thinking about how we occupy space, they evolve constantly. 
Um, I think, I mean, if we're, if we're good at what we do and we're successful, we don't over prescribe what the architecture should or shouldn't do. We try to create the opportunity um, for life to happen and for people to, uh, you know, contra- let's say this, contrary to the way architecture is represented typically through, particularly through images and, and, and photographs, um, it, it, that's not the way life is lived, right? Every chair is not placed in exactly the right place and every um, towel is not hanging perfectly on the towel rod it's um you have to you have to create and i think part of our job is to create spaces that can react and live with the people and with generations of people um as they occupy the building so this the notion behind one of the big kind of ideas behind this building is a kind of flexibility and not only spatial flexibility but also in terms of technical means and uses of these of this building so as research needs change and as as these kind of things evolve the building can be reconfigured and and re-outfit in in a pretty broad range of ways i suspect that your own your own family house um is a good uh would be an interesting study in the way that architecture of a given moment can also evolve right and and w- with with people's living patterns and of the of the of the Ossipoff buildings that I've been in they all strike me as entirely appropriate appropriate places to live in 2023 as much as they were probably in 1965 when they were when they were built or whenever yeah and I think that one thing that just came to my mind too was when you talk about changes in technology, one of the things that I've been noticing is that there was a time of expansion when all the banks, every place, certainly in the United States in growing communities, were opening branch banks all over the place because you physically had to go to the building to do your banking transactions. And now that has contracted tremendously because we do everything electronically. And these bank buildings, which were so significant in a lot of different neighborhoods, are closing. So Mm -hmm. it was this huge investment on the part of the banks to build all these structures, and now they are abandoning them, uh, in some Mm -hmm. cases actually selling them off completely and and losing the land as well. Nobody could have anticipated that 50 years ago, and yet now it's a thing. So this Mm -hmm. is a change that affects architecture. It is. It is. And I mean, the most recent example of that is is, is the post-pandemic world of, um, and, and this building is in wow. fact a great example of that. I mean, there. I think in this building, we have something around the order of 280 offices, individual person offices built that can be subdivided for, you know, offices for two people or three people or four people. But um, since even 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 though Harvard has gone completely back on campus with with teaching and research and so forth, um, the the utilization of these spaces is not what it had been anticipated to be even two years ago because people have become so used to remote working or are continue you know continue to fear um, whether it's corona or other viruses you know being in constant close contact to other people so. Um, even, even within the time it took, you know, from when this building opened till today, it's, um, there's been dramatic changes that call into question a whole bunch of decisions that were made, you know, eight or 10 years ago. Right. Right. Well, and then uh, yeah. maybe continuing this discussion, get the next slide up, but I would say, you know, what was following or what is following Corona is the energy crisis around the geopolitical messed up around here next in ukraine and 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 russia and things right so so that's another thing right if you're basically building a fossil building right that needs to be conditioned when people are not there the building still needs to be pumped in oil right it needs to be kept cool and warm because otherwise things basically dilapidate right so you're making Mm -hmm. a huge loss because all your revenue goes away because the tenants might move out and you still have to basically do the providing, you know, the, to the cooling and the heating in a fossil way, while in a bioclimatic way, you're way better off because you still have to keep, you know, the faucets running, which reminds me of one of our most scandalous German projects that Stefan talks about in the Velo uh, interview there, uh, which is our main uh, Berlin uh, um, <clears throat> airport. Which, uh, for several reasons, uh, was uh, not going into um, 
you know, being used for too long and people had to just, you know, there was staff there that had to constantly open and close the faucets and keep other things running. Too. But, so it's not like you can keep a building entirely, but again, in, in, in much of a less extent, right? So really, I mean, this, this all pays off your, you know, philosophy in, in, in a multitudinal way. We're uh, already cutting close to being done for today again in two minutes, but so we're going to probably pick up here. But let's quickly talk about this because this goes back to um, that in the building, as we remember from the last slide, there are these hubs and they're basically almost naturally organically formed where the, the, the corridor walls basically open up, right? Then they naturally form these hubs, these cluster hubs, and they become these, these spaces. They're both circulation and communication, uh, as we can imagine here. And there's other pictures where there's people in there, but you can easily imagine how that here is. And I just, um, just want to quickly uh, explain what the show quote is in there, because that's a material that Yuta Soto and I are very fond of, because it's a guardrail infill that's called, um, uh, what's it called? From Karl Stahl. Um, yeah, Stahlnetz. Yeah, Stahlnetz. And the X10 is the product name. And that's one that we once had a sample here that we're stretching that you're using here for the inside. We're saying we would love to see this being the uh, mandated, almost not really, we don't want to mandate anything really, but if you would mandate something as for <laughs> guardrails in Honolulu, we want to see that because it is letting the breeze through and uh, you know, it's not requiring any maintenance of glass you know, washing and it's also not keeping you hot behind. So it's, it's, it's good in many ways. And so that's the material, again, because you, 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 you have to make decisions on architecture again on all levels from the macro to the micro and obviously all the systems and material choice. So. That I think is worth to pick up again from here next week that you explain us a little bit more what's behind, uh, you know, hidden sort of information behind uh, what we <laughs> see here and we're eager to hear from you. Okay, so that being said, hopefully see you back next week. And uh, until then, please stay bravely bioclimatic. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.